um, I'm going to put the recording on. Uh, that's so that we can share it with anybody else that um, uh, wasn't able to make it today who's registered. Um, you Please feel free to be able to ask questions. Um, and Samantha, if you just put your yellow hand up on the screen, you can come pop off mute and ask the question as, as Samantha's talking, or if you prefer to put it in the chat, um, I can field those questions for you, no problem. Um, you are on mute, but as I said at the beginning, for anyone that's arrived late, we love to see your faces. So um, if you're willing to put your camera on, please, um, please feel free to do so. Um, so let's crack on and introduce you to Samantha. Uh, so Sam is a chartered financial advisor and a fellow of the Chartered Insurance uh, Institute. She's been advising clients for some years now and her clients are mainly women. Uh, from business women to stay-at-home mums, um, helping with divorce finances and of course generational planning, which um, will be key to us all at some point. And she's on a mission to help women make better informed decisions when it comes to finances, and really wants today's session to provide information to you to enable you to be empowered to make better financial choices. So Sam is also a busy mum of two children and really understands the juggling that's required for managing a career and being a mum. So over to you, Sam. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Morning, everybody. Uh, yes, on my tombstone, it will say she tried because I just see some women. We, we, the trouble is, if we don't get taught, if no one tells us how to make better decisions, then nothing will ever change. And sometimes we rely on our partners to, to, to guide us or our parents to have guided us or, or even through our education or our work. And sometimes we kind of learn by mistakes. Um, and my mission is to speak to as many women as possible so that you have the power to look at your own finances, whether they be big, small or indifferent, so that you can make the best out of them. So that primarily when you get to state pension age, which could be anything from 67, 68 or even 69, they're mooting, bringing forward the, the state pension age that you are not living on a pension pot of £54,000 in total. Someone said to me, is that a week? Is that a month? I said, no, that's, that's it. If you don't make better choices with your savings, you'll either have a pension pot of, of a, not enough amount to make a difference, let me tell you, or a state pension. State pension is currently, was well, going up this year, pension is getting a pay rise uh, next month of 10%, lucky them. Um, so it'll be about just under £10,000 a year. And that is not enough to live on comfortably. If you've got illusions of spending your retirement in Hawaii or Marbella, or even being able to shop in Waitrose once or twice, you need to do something a bit better. Just change what you've got. So. I am going to run through a presentation with you, just some top tips. This one is a real, um, it's really well received this presentation. I've done it a few times because it kind of gets to the heart of, um, sorry, let me just find the right one. Uh, let me go. gets to the heart of the matter because these are the things that are the most important things if you do nothing but today make a note of these top five things and I will have ticked my box in terms of giving you all something to take away so firstly this is me I'm a financial advisor um, typically women clients although I do have men clients um, but mostly women women like to deal with women in my experience I'm a mum I get it I'm busy we're all busy. I get the whole, I haven't got time for me stuff because I'm in that position sometimes. I am that person that nags you to make you do things for you. That is my job. Professional nag, my husband calls me, but that's a whole different story. One number one, priority, money management. So budgeting. I've done this a few times as well. Talked to some, some, some sessions to younger um, audience members. I'm talking early 20s about how to budget and why to budget and budgeting is not just for those that have got plenty of money even if you do have more than enough income every month you should still know what your budget is you should know the money you've got coming in your essential expenditure I'm talking mortgage rent council tax utilities which is ever on the increase um, 
and food, the things that are essential to your month for you to actually function. Costa coffee is not an essential, apparently. I might disagree there, actually. Coffee intake, probably one of my addictions. Um, so knowing what you've got coming in, less what you've got coming out is important. And knowing, checking your direct debits, checking that, that British Gas is only direct direct debiting you once a month, not twice. Uh, Sky is charging you what they should be charging you and not what they think they should be charging you. Checking regularly to make sure that what is going out is what you expect to go out. When you get to the end of the month, if there is a surplus, get into the habit of saving if you're not doing so already. The, the most important thing when it comes to saving is that you create yourself an emergency savings pot. I'm going to jump onto this slide here. Um, so emergency saving is can I survive for three to six months if I lose my job? I break my leg. I can't work for a few months. Or have I got generous sickness benefit from my employer if you're employed? But you should, regardless of your employment status, still have some money tucked away, emergency savings for the what ifs. What if the boiler falls off the wall? What if the exhaust pipe falls off the wall? You know, just those emergencies. Now, ideally, that should cover three to six months. I'm cautious. I would always say six months is better. Sometimes that's a bit of a stretch to people to save six months worth of bills. But that should be your goal. Once you've achieved your six months bills and if you've got a partner or you're married, then, you know, it can be between you. You're probably jointly responsible for some things. Um, and where should you hold the savings? I get asked that a lot. Well, your emergency savings should have no risk attached to it. So you should be investing in a cash ISA, uh, premium bonds, a deposit account, a savings account, some bank account based place where your that money is not going to be at risk of the markets because you need that money. That gives you some peace of mind that should the worst happen, you're covered. You're covered for six months. That then allows you to view your other savings, your pensions, any investments you have um, with a bit more of a freer mind because you know, actually, I'm covered for six months. I can take a little bit more risk with my next level of savings. So savings is key. Have the money, making sure you have the money at arm's length from your main bank account is also important. So don't leave your emergency savings in your same monthly slush pot because you will be tempted to use it. It will just be there. Make sure you've moved it away to a separate account. It's still readily accessible, but just not immediately accessible for you on a day to day basis. And that then becomes you making sure that in your mind you've got that pot over there in a distinct account for your savings. Um, so that's budgeting and review every couple of months. Once you've you know done your spreadsheet, you know what's coming in, you know what's going out, you know what your savings pot looks like, and review it every few months to make sure you're still on that target. Nothing's changed dramatically, um, and actually these days it's worth checking those bank statements, um, which we all of us really got out of the habit of doing uh, for scammers. So scammers tend to start with taking 79p from your account, which none of us probably miss on a data basis. And then they start, then it's £4.79 and then it's £9.97 and then it's £15. For, and you can see the scammer will slowly build up if they've got access to your bank accounts um, until they're taking something meaningful and they will keep trying until it says computer says no. Those scammers are so clever, so unbelievably clever. One of my clients rang to say, a couple of weeks ago, she was called by who she thought was the bank to say a genuine payment that she had made to the tax man there was a problem with. Now, she thought, who else would know that payment had been made other than my um, bank, which was NatWest, I think. Um, so she believed who he was. Whilst he was on the phone to her, he was reading out her bank statements. He was reading out her transactions. And whilst he was on the phone to her, he was taking the money from her account into an account and with HSBC. They are so clever. So check, be cautious. Um, and if, if in doubt, put the phone down uh, and go into the branch. Lesson over for budgeting. Any questions on that one? All, all right?
I can see some things in the chat room. Is that all good? Yeah, it's not relating to um, that particular okay. point. Um, yeah. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so let's jump to credit. Um, now, it was this part is about dispelling some myths because if you check your credit score, that does not mean you are leaving yourself a footprint. OK, so you are entitled to check your credit score to make sure that what is there is actually down to you. No one else has taken a phone contract out or, or, or a loan in your name without you knowing about it. Remember, these scammers are super clever. How do you check your credit score? Well, you can use some bank accounts are linked to credit scores now. Um, I know Barclays give you an automatic Experian check, so you can go in there monthly and have a look and see what's on your report. It will also give you some help, helpful hints about why maybe your score is at the level it is and whether it can be improved. Sometimes it's having too much credit. So if you've got a credit card and you're holding more than 50% of the balance, that goes against you. Paying monthly on time goes for you. So credit score is a bit of a swingometer each month in terms of how you're behaving with your credit um, and, and when things aren't, aren't so good. The worst thing to do with credit is to miss a payment. It will be, it's held against you for three years. It just comes up time and time again. So if it absolutely, if you can, unless you can really, really, really avoid it, make sure you pay your credits. Even if you reduce to minimum payments, um, credits need to be paid on time check that what's on your credit file is all for you um, and no one else is using that postcode to get credit uh, especially if you're in a rental situation where there's been multiple tenants in that address uh, you can find people can be quite sneaky with um, how they use other people's credit so just check what's registered against you is genuinely yours because it will have your an impact of mortgage borrowing you know if you need a car loan all those sorts of things um, Good credit uh, on the sort of it's a sliding scale now. Um, uh, good credit is 881 up to a thousand um, and then it, it will reduce depending on your credit. Keep an eye on it. Don't lose sleep over it, but check it. It's a bit like budgeting. Check it every couple of months. Just check it's you. It is all you and it's right. Um, if you haven't got a credit card, should you get a credit card? Well, if you are thinking at some point of mortgaging or, or needing to buy something via a loan, then yes, have a credit card. Plenty of credit card um, companies will, off, will do a pre-check, a soft check on you to see whether or not you're likely to um, be able to receive a credit card. Um, I think it's called creditcardchecker.com, actually. Um, although I will confirm that. And they will confirm, given your postcode and your salary, um what your likely uh, credit balance would be and even if you don't use it just having the credit card or putting one of your food shopping every month on it and then paying it straight off will will generate good credit scores uh, making sure you're on the electoral roll is also important in uh, for your credit scoring as well because they know where, who you are and where you are essentially so credit just keep an eye on it and it is it's, it's important especially these days Samantha, is there a website, is there one place to go and check that you would advise that's legitimate? For checking the credit, hmm. uh, so I use Experian. Um, there is another one that, that the name escapes me currently, but there are two main credit checker scores, <coughs> excuse me, but Experian, you can log on, create an account, you get 30 days free, I think, and then after that it about 9.99 a month um but you can log on and certainly have a snapshot look at it for that first month uh, and just check what's there and if it looks all right then you can maybe check annually okay um, but keep an eye on it um but Experian is the one that I use um okay so priority number two so this is pensions pensions I sleep dream and eat pensions this is because when I read this statistic of the average women, women's pension pot at 65 being 54,000 pounds and a man's is 157,000 pounds. It made me sweat, it really did. I thought 54,000 um, pounds, when you're, when you're talking to me as a client, I'm looking at you surviving until you're 99. That's how long I have to project your pension funds to last so that you don't run out. Because we all underestimate how long we're gonna live for. Um, so save, 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 review what you've got, 
never underestimate what you've already accumulated. So if you've got previous jobs where you've got little pots from legal in general and Scottish widows um, and all, you know, all the, the insurers where you've chopped and changed jobs, maybe pre having a family or pre taking time off to, for caring, um, know who they're with, what they are, where they're invested. That's so important. Um, if we haven't made a decision as to our investment choices in our pension fund, which 99.99% of the population do not choose their own pension funds. They will just go with the default fund that's off offered to them. So you, you start your new role, sign the paperwork to join the pension scheme, and you don't say where you want to invest, which funds you want to use. You will be just put, be put in what we call the default fund, which is that insurer's kind of safe place for you to go. The default funds have got better over time because the insurers all know that we're an apathetic lot and we won't change that. We won't review it. it. I've never come across a client yet that said, you know, every year I go in and check my fund performance and I move it if it's been rubbish. No one has yet said that to me. I, I wait for the day. Um, so know where you're invested and read the description of that default fund. Is that is that right for you? Because sometimes they will be cautious. And actually, if you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s or even your early 50s, you don't need to be in a cautious fund. It will do bugger all technical term. You need something with a bit more of an equity mix in it. It needs to have equities, which is stock markets, in order for you to get your growth. And that money in a pension fund has got a long time to grow before you can touch it. So it needs to have a bit of risk attached to it so that you can get some growth to it. Cautious is money in the bank. No risk, no return, essentially, other than a little bit of interest you're going to get now. Pension fund monies, they're invested. They need to be treat, treated differently and seen for that longer term. So dig out that pension paperwork that you file every year when it comes through the post, because I know most of you will have a drawer somewhere or it will sit on top of the microwave that you know you've got stuff to do with that paperwork and either contact someone like me or be brave, open the pension work, the paperwork, see what you've got, see where you're invested and see whether actually it resonates. Is that right for me right now? Do they have my right address? Do they have my right surname? Have I got married? Have I got divorced? Have I made a nomination? This is what happens to your pension fund in the event of your death. And most of us think we're immortal, but I'm telling you at some point something will happen. And whether that's at 99 or 54, something will happen at some point. Pension funds are never lost. They are payable to your nearest and dearest, usually tax free if you've died pre 75. So when you start to add up all your little pots, all of a sudden you've got money there. That is death benefits for your children or your partner or your husband or whoever you want to leave it to. So make sure your nomination form and they're all available online. And you also if you've got a Scottish Widows plan, log on to your portal. There'll be a nomination form. Make sure you fill it out and list everyone. If you've got husband or wife or and, and children and nieces and nephews that you want to leave it to list everyone, because then the insurer knows who to contemplate pain when when you get there and if you've if you've listed a boyfriend or a partner and you've changed partners or boyfriends or girlfriends or whoever um change the nomination because otherwise they're going to be really grateful if you're not here anymore and you've nominated them to receive your pension benefits it does happen people go oh I was that was my boyfriend from 33 years ago brilliant I'm sure he'll be delighted to receive your pension death benefits still so review, 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 have a plan. In your mind, know that actually you want to retire at 60. So most people's state pension age is going to be 60, 67, 68, 69. That's a long time in the future. So if you think I don't want to work till I'm that old, think actually 60, 62 is maybe more reasonable to think I'm going to work to. Or if you're a business owner, you might think I'm never going to retire. I love it. I'm going to sell my business. I'm going to keep going and I'm going to pass it down to my children or my grandchildren. Um, 
but you still need a pension. You still need a plan. So know what you've got coming, know what your state pension looks like. £10,000-ish pounds a year if you've worked 35 years or had 35 years national insurance credit. So if you've received child benefit or some of the universal credits, you'll get a tick in the box. 35 years for a full state pension. You can check your state pension entitlement on the Government Gateway website. That's Just keep an eye on it. Check your national insurance record is up to date, as exciting as that sounds. Really important because your state pension is your kind of your bedrock to your, your, your um, pension's income. So if you think you actually want to retire earlier than your state pension age, you need to save. You need to make sure that the money you've got in your pensions is doing as much for you as possible. Um, so if you're self-employed, make sure you get into the habit of saving into your pension. If you're a non-limited company, so you're a sole trader, you can make a pension contribution and they give you your tax back. So you make an £80 contribution to your pension every month, the government will bung you a 20 quid bonus. So the more you save, the more the government will give you back. The more, uh, so, and if you're a 40% taxpayer, you get 40% back. C'est magique. And you know what? It's there and it is, it's perfectly legitimate and it won't be there for forever because pensions tax relief is the same cost to the government as the arms bill, the arms budget. So it's, it's, it's a low hanging fruit. We know at some point they're going to change pensions tax relief, but it is here so we make hay. The more you save, the more tax you will get back. If you're a business owner, you can make, so a limited company owner, you can make yourself a pension contribution that is just that is classed as a business expense that comes out before your corporation tax is calculated. Happy days. It's free money to get out of the business. So never a bad reason to make a pension contribution. And pensions are also outside of your estate for inheritance tax. So if your estate is looking sizable, and we'll come on to that at the end, pensions are completely separate from that. That's why you need to keep your nomination forms up to date. So anyone have any questions about that? Yeah, I've got one. Maybe other people are thinking. Um, well, no. um, <clears throat> regarding the understood the business owner point of view, but if you're self-employed versus employed, is the tax relief the same it, as long as you're paying in to presumably a private pension or does it also correlate with a work pension? So if you're employed, Mm -hmm. then your employer has to offer you a workplace pension under auto yeah. enrolment regulations. Yeah. He has to pay 3% and you have to pay 5%. Yeah. Overall, there needs to be an 8% contribution. Sometimes that's four and four, depending on if you've got a, a generous employer or not. And if, by the way, the employer offers you a matching arrangement, so if you pay five, they'll pay five, you pay six, they'll pay six, bite their hand off. It's free money. And honestly, after the first month's, you know, ouch, ouch, out of my pay packet, you'll get used to it. And actually you're doing the best thing that you can ever do for yourself. Um, so if you're employed, depending on the type of pension scheme your employer offers, he'll either operate salary sacrifice or salary exchange. That means you give up the portion of that salary that would be your pension contribution. So let's just say you earn £25,000 a year and your pension contributions of 5% equate to £4,000 a year. You, He would reduce your salary by £4,000 a year. He or she, I should say. Um, so you don't pay national insurance or income tax on that £4,000. So you've got an immediate saving there. The employer pays that money as an employer contribution into the pension scheme for you. So there's a different way of working it. Um, but tax relief is granted. It's just at what point in that journey, depending on what type of pension arrangement you're in. Okay. Okay. But the sweet spot, if you're a company director, is being able to make yourself contribution. That is a business expense. I mean, it's it's amazing. It's a real sweet spot. Um, and remember, you can make a contribution up to 100% of your earnings, which always makes people giggle. But actually, if you've had an inheritance or you've had a you know, bonus or something gives you the opportunity to use a bit more of your allowance, um, then you can get tax relief on that money and you've squirreled it away for yourself for later. 100% um, of earnings up to 40,000 a year. So you've got to go some to save. Good. OK, uh, so that's me rattling on about pensions. I could probably do all day on that if you let me. 
Um, savings we've covered. So we've talked about emergency savings. So if you've got anything more than your em emergency pot, and you, you've got some inheritance or you've got further savings that you've been really good at accumulating, where should you put those? I'm a fan of premium bonds. Um, you can hold up to £50,000 in premium bonds and you're in the, in the draw every month to win. 25 quid minimum, million pounds maximum. So the more you hold in premium bonds, the more you will win. And some of my clients hold the maximum, they win every month. And that essentially is their investment return on that money, um, which is always nice to get a check through or a direct debit notification through. Um, no risk to premium bonds, government backed, risk free. I quite I like those as a spread across your investment portfolio. Anything more than that, you need to be thinking about using your stocks and shares ISA. So ISA allowance, £20,000 a year, cash combined with cash and stocks and shares ISA. Um, money invests, growth uh, grows tax-free and you can take it out tax-free without penalty. £20,000 a year. I like to use a stocks and shares ISA. It's a bit of a misnomer. You can up direct, invest directly with stocks and stocks and shares, but actually most um, stocks and shares ISAs are big investment funds. So you're not having to pick directly because no one is an expert other than the you know, fund managers themselves, um, unless you think you know what you're doing, which some people do and some people do it really badly. Um, but investing in big funds, big insurance funds, is, is the way to spread your risk. You pick a fund that's in, in accordance with your risk profile, and that's where your money is invested. It's at risk because it's, it you know, goes up and down with the markets. That's your longer term savings pot. You've got your emergency savings, that's your immediate access to cash. Your mid term savings, which I would suggest is your stocks and shares ISA, because it's invested for the longer term. And then your ultimate savings, which is your retirement savings. So having a blend of savings for different reasons is important. OK, any questions? All good? Hi, I have a question. OK. This is Masume Hidayatullah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for a brilliant expose so far. Um, I okay. have recently started freelancing okay. and I'm not filing accounts and I do have some rental income. So I wanted to ask if rental income and ad hoc sole trader type income qualifies for pension tax relief at the basic rates. Um, so your earned income does, uh, but your rental income doesn't. Very good, thank you. Thank okay. you so much. Unless your rental income is You've, you've incorporated your rental properties into a business, a limited company, then it then it kind of can. But yeah, no, they don't allow you that bite of that cherry, unfortunately. OK, thank you. Okay. And if you're a non earner, everyone is allowed to make contributions per annum of three thousand six hundred. Um, and you that's with the tax relief. So actually, your contribution is two thousand eight hundred and eighty. The government give you 20 percent back whether you're a taxpayer or not. So you can still contribute to a pension if finances permit, even if you're a non-taxpayer, a non-earner. So that's always handy to have. I try and encourage, you know, mums or dads that have gone on maternity, paternity leave that might be taking a career break for a few years to make sure that the pension is, is topped up because oft, often the one that's forgotten. And that's hence one of the reasons why there's such a disparity in men and women's pensions at retirement age because we're the ones that tend to work part-time take the gaps take the hit but actually if you can if you can convince someone or your finances allow to keep paying into your pension whilst you or he or she is off work for a little while makes so much difference in the long term um hello samantha and yep. everyone can, hello. can i ask a question um i, I moved abroad um, two years ago i worked in the uk for i think eight years but yeah. I'm not sure if I'm entitled to the public pension because I've heard that I should contribute 10 years, if I'm not wrong. Oh. And yeah. where so to this, check this, this information? Okay, so yeah. you're talking about a state pension that you would receive at 67, 68. Yes. Um, you're right. In order to receive any state pension at all you need to have earned a minimum of 10 years 10 years national insurance credits or contributions 
You can log on to the UK's government gateway, create yourself an account. You'll need your passport, etc. And you can log mm -hmm. on to find your national insurance record and it will tell you how many years you've got and whether or not you qualify for any state pension. Okay, so uh, I will check if they are fully, all the years have fully contributed, is it? Yes, absolutely. The, okay. the government, okay. the, the government, DWP, the Department for Work and Pensions, will have a record of your national insurance contributions that have been paid across. So they'll know how many years you've got um, and depending on where you're living in the world and subject to Brexit agreements uh, is whether oh, yes. or not you can you can pick your record up and, and take it to where you're going to retire or not. That bit's undecided currently. Okay. Did you say, Samantha, Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, Lisa. Did you say, Samantha, That's that okay. it, you have 10 years, um, it's a full state pension? No, so 10 years to earn a pound. Um, oh. So you need 10 years to qualify for... Um, any state pension maximum is 35 years so it used to be one and now it's 10. I see. Okay but you can check it and you can keep an eye on it <clears throat> and if you miss some years uh, you can you can catch up you can go back seven years um, and mop up but if you've got you know your working life is still ahead of you then there's no point doing it if you still got the potential ahead of you to, to maximize out of 35 years unfortunately some people work more than 35 years and you don't get a refund it's just how it is you just pay your national insurance until you get to your state pension age essentially okay we have another question i think relative to this topic okay would you like to come off mute sure thank you um it was just on the 35 years so um does it differ at all depending on when you were born? Because I thought there were rules around that. Um, so, well, anyone that's going to retire post 2016 has got 35 years. Right. OK, thank you. Yeah, they used to, it used to be 25 years and it was 30 years. But now it is, it is 35 years for anyone retiring post 2016. Thank you. OK. Um, OK, so we've done pensions, we've done savings. Let's now talk about life insurance. So we're good for time. Um, so the most common type of life insurance is your mortgage protection. If you've got a mortgage, so you've got a mortgage and your mortgage broker will have convinced you at that time that you should cover the mortgage liability in the event of your death. If you've got children or you've got a partner, just to make sure that something happens to you or him or her, um, that that mortgage is paid off in full. Um, so the cheapest form of that, some companies call it mortgage protection. Actually, its official title is term assurance because the insurance runs for a term, a fixed term, which will be the same as the term of your mortgage. You can have, there's three types, but the most common one is a decreasing term, um, which means you take a mortgage out for £250,000 and your insurance starts at £250,000. So each year you're going to repay the capital on your mortgage. So by the end of year one, your £250,000 mortgage is £240,000 at the end of the year. And your insurance reduces proportionately with the amount that you would have paid off your mortgage. It assumes 8%, um, which is normally there or thereabouts. And um, that's the cheapest form in life insurance. When you're nice and young and healthy, it's something like £10 per 100,000. So cheap as chips and absolutely you should have it. If you're not married and you bought a property with a partner or a friend, then you should make sure that life insurance is in trust so that it, for the money when it's paid out, um, avoid your estate for inheritance tax. So there's some there's some. Plan, tax planning to do if you're married then you don't do that because your rights automatically pass between husband and wife on death if you've moved house and changed mortgage or added a bit to your mortgage for an extension or debt consolidation or whatever it is make sure your life cover is always appropriate at the appropriate level don't forget to do it because the longer you leave it the older you are the more expensive it gets most life insurance is, is what we call reviewable. So if you dig out your policy summary that most people never read, it will say policy is reviewable. This means you can ring up legal in general, Scottish widows, whoever, and say, I'd like to increase the amount. And they don't recheck your health position at that time. You would just automatically get the right to increase the cover back up 
without them asking you any more medical conditions, which is quite handy if you've had an illness, you've suffered a, some, a cancer scare or something, um, it means you can increase your, your life insurance without it costing you very much more money. Because if you rewrite a policy when someone's had some a serious illness or a, ser a serious um, health event, then your life insurance obviously will be will be expensive and sometimes unaffordable. Um, some people say to me, oh, I've got death in service cover with my employer. So that means when you start with a, a sizable enough employer on your death, they will pay you a multiple of your salary, sometimes three times or four times salary in a, in a lump sum on your death. And that's the reason that they won't take out separate life insurance. Um, which is all right if you're really, really worried about the pennies in the short term. But if you're going to chop and change jobs, that's not a solution because some employers don't offer death in service. And then at some point in your career, you're going to be coverless. Um, so there's decreasing term insurance and there's level term insurance. And that is what it says on the tin. The amount stays the same. So you're paying your mortgage off, but the amount of the life cover stays the same. So you've always got a bit of a gap. Um, and that can be quite handy if you want to leave some money to children or you want to make sure there's a surplus pot in the event of your death over and above uh, the mortgage amount. All these things, so life insurance, yeah, go on. Sorry, Samantha, Elisa just has a question, so I'm sure it's yep. relevant to what you're talking okay. about. Elisa, do you want to pop off mute? Hello, sorry, no, the question is related to the pensions folks. Okay. Um, I just remember. I just remembered the, I had it on mind. I have several pension spots and I don't know how many. Uh, do you recommend to put it all on, in one single pot or is it a bit risky? Um, well, it depends. So you're going to have to be brave and open the envelopes and see what you've got, see what type of pensions they are and see whether there's any words in that policy that says guaranteed. Um, if there's anything that looks like it's given you a guaranteed bonus or a guaranteed something at retirement date, then you leave that one where it is. If they're just a multiple of pension pots from different workplace employers, so you've got a few thousand with legal in general, a few thousand with reassure, et cetera, then normally mm -hmm. you're best to consolidate because like anything, everyone everyone makes money insurers included believe it or not so if you've got four or five pension pots you're paying four or five charges so and if the pots are small all that tends to happen is year on year the charges erode the value of your pot because they're not big enough to kind of get going and get you some investment return so if you're not sure at the end, um, I offer a free consultation, which I'll do a free pensions review to see whether or not it's better to put them all into one or leave them where they are. But there's a there's a slide at the end if you want to do that. Oh, OK, OK, brilliant. So you will just leave your details at the end, right? Yeah. OK, thank you so okay. much. You're yeah. welcome. <clears throat> OK, so any any more pension questions? I will go back to life insurance as exciting as that is. Masume, come, yeah, come off mute. Hi, thank you. I have a really quick question on the state pension. Do the 35 okay. years of contribution need to be contiguous, if that's the right word? Or can you take breaks in years as long as you get to 35 across the board? Yeah, absolutely, the latter. So if you log on to your, um, your national insurance record on your government gateway account, you go into the link that's called check www.gov.uk. So make sure it's the gov.uk site and it's check hyphen my hyphen state hyphen pension. Check my state pension. Log in through there and it'll tell you what your state pension is looking like it's going to be. And it will give you that awful date in about a million years when it will come into payment. But you can then also from that page, check your national insurance record. And it, it's quite funny, as old as me, to go back in time and see your like, first part-time job or your job at uni and see then when I had time off for the children but then I was collecting child benefit for a little while that gives you a tick in the box for state pension so you'll see that it's not continuous naturally we've got gaps for different reasons but as long as by the time you get to 67 you've got 35 years in total you will get your full entitlement but that's a good way of checking that your national insurance record is up to date because some employers in the earlier years weren't so great at um, passing over records. 
So keeping an eye on it's a good, another good thing. Thank you. So if I've hit 35 years and say this tax year, I don't make any NI contributions, it's not a problem. If you're accountant or you're, if you've earned below the threshold, then no, it's not. If you've got 35 or you've still got a bit of a gap in the future where if you need to, you can mop up a couple of years. Yeah, I would I'd just, just know where you're at now and, and sort of have a little plan in place. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Okay, um, so life cover, check the life cover you've got. I was just about to say, life cover is as cheap as chips and it, it doesn't, unless you've had a health problem, you can chop and change a bit like car insurance, okay? Because rates for different companies do change over the years. You can, uh, there'll be rate checkers online, come to someone like me, you can do a quick uh, whole of market search. Um, you need height, weight, address, occupation, salary, and then you can do a life insurance quote. So cheap as chips and easy to chop and change. So don't don't assume because you've taken it out years ago that it could be the best value for money. Sometimes I'll do a newer policy with better facilities added for free these days and it's saving a bit of money too. There's a lot of the life cover companies will offer you 24-7 GP service, a helping hands, so a bit of counselling, all the sort of extra freebies that, that actually make a difference these days. Uh, critical illness is what it says. Um, it uh, uh, ensures you should you suffer with one of the conditions that's on whoever um, you've got the insurance with their list. So it could be cancer, but it will be very specific in, in where it is in the body and the grade and the seriousness. You can insure for 25,000, 50,000 up to a million pounds and it will pay out a lump sum on the diagnosis of their, their illness. Um, pays out once and then it's done but it allows you time to then recover make any house amends if you needed to make adjustments at home or for carers etc it's quite an expensive insurance because one out of two of us will claim on it um one out of two of us will suffer with something that means we'll need to claim on it so it is it is probably the most expensive insurance which is not to say don't do it just know that ideally that's really where you will want to be because you know we will all have something possibly at some point income protection um protects your income should you fall uh through ill through sickness unemployment um not if you've purposely lost your job but uh, if you've been made redundant income protection can ensure um your income pay a mortgage pay your bills for a few months not or not an expensive insurance um what makes it expensive is if you claim on it very quickly. So normally when you set an income protection policy up, you have what we call a deferred period. So this is when you break your leg. It's a serious break. You know you're going to be out for a few months. You haven't got any medical cover at work. Um, you use your emergency savings in the first instance. That pays your mortgage and your bills. And then your income protection kicks in at six months. That makes it a cheaper, more affordable policy. And then it, it continues for the longer term. Um, but there's there's insurances for just about everything. So if you think you want something particular covered, then you just speak to a, to a specialist um, about cost and knowing that you're not overinsured and you're not underinsured. Your children or your family are protected and it should maybe that policy should be written in trust. And that, putting a policy in trust isn't scary. It's free, but you need to know when you need to do it. So, um, yeah, know what you've got, what you're paying for as part of your budgeting and know what sort of levels of insurance that you've got. Okay, all good? All good. All good. So I was gonna say we've reached time, but this is such a brilliant conversation. Please, um, I think you've got one more top tip for yeah. us. So please stay with us if you can. Um, I think we're all learning heaps, so carry on. <laughs> carry on <Sarah. laughs> okay. this, is the, this is the scary one. Makes people go, <gasps> um, I will. Why do you need a will? If you have got children, you need a will because in the event of your and or your partner or their father or mother's death, your children will go straight into care. Your mum, your dad, your brother, your sister, your best friend, your neighbour will not automatically look after your children for you. They will go straight into care. The court of protection will take months to decide whether or not your mum, your dad, etc., is the right place for your children to go. But they will go into care. Um, to avoid this, and that's a stressful enough thought if you're a parent, all you need is a simple will for 
to name a guardian for your children. And that stops that process. There will still be some checks and balances done to make sure that they're appropriate and you know, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it misses out that big court of protection issue and them going into care. So number one for children, if you are a property owner, you need a will. Because if you think you're just gonna leave your, your estate to intestacy, because it's going to go to your daughter or your, your son or whatever, it's a mess. It takes months. It takes months for probate to be granted. Um, and in that time, your hands will be tied. There'll be, you have got no power to do anything because there's no written instruction from the deceased as to who's to manage what or look after what or access what. So you'll have no immediate access to funds for funerals, um, paying any debts on the estate. It literally is tied. So make a will. Just say who you want to have what. Leave it, make it simple. You don't need to make a complicated will unless you've got an estate the size of Downton Abbey. Um, if you've just got a house with children and you're married or you're living with a partner, then the will, we call that a simple mirror will. So the best way to describe that is me to you, you to me and everything after that to the children. And that's all it needs to be. But having one is so, so important. You can list cash gifts in there if you want to, to your neighbours or your friends. But just having your residual estate paid to your children also means that you maximise your inheritance tax allowances as well. And if you're married and you've got children and you leave your, your residence to your children on second death, you've got a million pounds usually of inheritance tax free allowances. So if you've got an estate that's that's rocking towards half a million pounds, then, you know, Another reason to have a will is for that alone, to make sure that you're maximising your inheritance tax allowances, because if you don't, what happens is anything over your allowance is subject to 40 percent tax on your death. And it's so easily remedied in your lifetime. So knowing a little bit is really, really powerful when it comes to wills. You don't need to spend a fortune on a will. Don't go to a high street solicitor that will charge you a thousand pounds unless your estate is super, super complicated. Um, some of the charities run um, free will month. Um, some and there's always a charity every month running it. Sometimes it's the British uh, the Red Cross or uh, RSPCA, and where you'll make a charitable donation. I would suggest fifty quid or something, and then they will write you a free will. And if you've thought about how you want your estate to play out, everything to me, everything to my husband, then to my children, and a, and a bit to the cat's home, etc. It's so easy for them to draw up, and so important that you've got it. Your will ends on divorce. So you need to make sure you get a new will post divorce um, and make sure the executors that you choose in your will, so who you want to administer your state on your death, are still alive. So if they predecease you, you need a new will. So um, yes, being organized is a is a brilliant thing. Um, to that point, Samantha, a great tip about the um, free will month, not something I've, I've heard of before, so that's great to know. What about um, online wills? There's a question, you know, do you recommend them? Are they legit? Steer clear? You know that old saying, you get what you pay for? Yeah. <laughs> um, because some of the online wills use a template, which it won't take into account your personal circumstances, it's just a bog standard and pretty rubbish is what I tend to say. Use use a professional, use the free will writing service for the charities, or come to someone like me who can connect you with someone who is reasonable and doesn't charge ridiculous amounts of money. If you want some help setting it up and thinking about it, then some people need a bit more guidance than others. Yeah. Depends what you've got and, and how you want to divvy things up, but having one is so important. And to that, to that second point, um, there's a question as to whether family, and I'm assuming here we mean direct family, can be um, uh, executors of your will. Yes, they can. They can. That's fine. Okay. And that's and, normal. So I would, you know, I would, if my children were older, they were adults, I would say that they would be my executors. And also they're going to be my main beneficiaries as well. It doesn't stop you being one or the other. And the point that you made about children going into care, which I think I've only recently learned that I found that quite, um, quite astounding because it's not something you think will happen if you have family that can take them. Um, I assume the age is 18. Is that correct? Yeah. Guardians will cease at 18 when children allegedly should be grown up enough to look after themselves. 
and I can help them can. met my children <laughs> <laughs> and mine um, and older siblings uh i.e 18 years or more look after a younger sibling yeah that's fine um i just suggest you probably want to ask them first yeah <laughs> Yeah, probably, probably a good idea. That could be a row. You know, you're not here. I'm not doing that. Well, I guess not a row. We're going to be witnessing, so maybe not <laughs> such a bad thing. Um, and then, if I may, just pop back to a question um, about pensions being subject to inheritance tax. So, if you're the beneficiary of a your partner's pension, um, are you subject to inheritance tax? No, pensions. Whilst the pensions are in the wrapper, so don't take them out of the pension fund unless you absolutely have to. Um, they are outside your estate for inheritance tax. They are super, super special pensions. There we go. Very good. Thank you. Those are the best. Um, that is my QR code. People can snap that if they want to catch up with me about anything. Um, no charge. So if someone wants to chat about something that they didn't want to talk about, you know, publicly, or they want a pension review or an IHT review or anything, then they make contact. More than happy to help and empower and then my tombstone that reads, she tried. You can all say, yeah, she did. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, Sam. One other question, just because it relates to death. Um, yeah. Not that you want to finish on. <laughs> <laughs> Happy <laughs> day. Yeah, let's all finish on something brighter, maybe. But um, the question is, um, is the assumption correct that if a mother dies and then the father um, that parental responsibility passes, you know, to the living parents. So only care only comes into play when both parents are dead. Yes, that's right. OK, as long as you haven't divorced and there's some issue in the divorce settlement. So as long as you're together at a date of death, then, yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Well, on behalf of everyone on the call um, and myself, I think that's been truly a brilliant session. Um, Samantha, you've been fantastic, really. Uh, gracious with your knowledge really clear and I'm sure you'll have a few people following up with you directly or quickly running um, to get their will made <laughs> <laughs> yeah that normally happens <laughs> <laughs> or both <laughs> so amazing we've had lots of amazing you know thank yous in in the chat um, and everybody here as I said at the beginning I will share the recording uh, later today and Sam's details will also be in there okay so thank you for attending. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And we and Samantha, thank you very, very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking thank us you so questions. Much. You're welcome. Bye.